It's a new week. Let's get it started with current and relevant business conversations here on Business Morning, coming to you live on Channel Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa, and the first attention goes to the global oil space, where prices inch higher today as worries about tight supply persisted, even as investors eye the release of supplies from strategic reserves from consuming nations and the truce in Yemen sparked hopes that supply issues in the Middle East could abate. Brent crude features were up $0.09 cents to $104.48 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude was at $99.30 a barrel, and that's up $0.03. Cents. Both contracts slipped a dollar when markets opened today. The United Nations has brokered a two-month truce between a Saudi-led coalition and the Houthi group aligned with Iran for the first time in the seven-year conflict. Saudi oil facilities have come under attack by the Houthis during the conflict, adding to supply disruption from Russia. The Russian oil industry has been hit by Western sanctions and buyer aversion after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Estimates of the Russian oil supply loss range from a million to three million barrels per day. Heading to Nigeria now from January the 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2030 has been declared as the decade of gas development for Nigeria. And that's by the federal government. Well, this comes to test as major European countries seek alternatives to Russia, which exports about 45 percent gas, which is their source of heat and energy industry players have been x-raying possibilities of Nigeria stepping in to cushion that disrupted supply. As the NNPC Limited says, it is currently working on building pipelines that will deliver gas from Nigeria to Europe. We'll capture that in this report. Nigeria has the largest proven gas reserves in Africa and the ninth largest in the world with 5.68 billion cubic meters of natural gas, even more than the proven oil reserves, which is at 36.97 million barrels. The country's gas reserves are over 900 times the total oil reserves, yet it has received less attention. One of the consequences of that has been huge losses through gas flaring, which is an offshoot of crude production. Between 2016 and 2020, Nigeria flared over 1.25 trillion cubic feet of natural gas into the atmosphere, and that's according to the NNPC oil and gas reports. PwC estimates the loss of 233 billion naira to gas flaring that translates to 3.8 percent of global total cost in 2018. For a long time, there was no use for gas, particularly locally. So it was until 1999 when you had the NLNG and you began to have the also condensed and NGLs and all of that. Those international projects, those projects for gas export. So Nigeria began to export gas and flaring started to reduce. The issue was recently deliberated on the floor of the House of Representatives and it considered that in 2002, NNPC Limited and the Algerian National Oil and Gas Company signed a memorandum of understanding for a $12 billion, 4.128 kilometer natural gas pipeline project. This was projected to have an annual capacity of 30 billion cubic meters that will extend gas supply to Europe. There's a $2.89 billion Trans-Nigeria gas pipeline, which should run from Kwaibo Terminal to the gas terminal in Kadu. It has 3.5 billion cubic meters capacity per year. There's also the 678-kilometer West African gas pipeline, a natural gas pipeline to supply gas from Nigeria's Escravos region of the Niger Delta area to Benin, Togo, and Ghana. The state of these projects have become topics of conversations after the federal government responded to the need to plug the gas supply shortage in Europe following Russian invasion to Ukraine. The house is off to urge the NNPC to provide information regarding the implementation, funds utilization, and status of the project. Also urge the NNPC to review the National Gas Master Plan in relation to the project to conform with the variables of today's global economy. 
Although there have been agreements and arrangements on pipeline projects, the private sector remains the backbone of investment in the sector. This, according to Dr. Ayodeleoni, is what the Petroleum Industry Act offers. And of course, we've got our own local issues too. We need to do much more in terms of policy stability and same policies through. While attention is currently on exporting gas to boost the country's foreign reserve, there are others in the sector who believe that areas such as converting flared gas into useful form to power machines, produce fertilizer, among others, are the low-hanging fruit and should be given priority. Based on statistics, about 2015, we we're consuming about maybe 50,000 metric tons, but right now we're consuming about 1.2 million metric tons, and Nigeria still doesn't have capacity for it. And that was why, you know, the Nigeria LNG, you know, decided to domesticate all its production so that we, they can increase local demand. So I would expect that even though, you know, helping countries like Ukraine, uh, Europe, and, uh, um, yeah, and all of that is good because it helps us with foreign earnings, it's still important for us to domesticate, try to look at the local market, see how you can increase the supply, you know, before we now decide to go global. Whether for domestic use or for export, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has turned attention to the vast potential of gas, which is in Nigeria and remains largely untapped. In John Mekwa, Channel Television News. And from gas, we look at Nigeria's reserve. Well, the country's FX reserve recorded its first gain in four weeks as it increased by $21.11 million week to week to close at $39.55, $39.55 billion. That's at the 29th of March. Uh, has this increase come to stay or is it transitory? We have the chief executive, uh, chief economist at PwC Nigeria, Andrew Nevin, now joining us for that conversation. Good morning, Mr. Nevin. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Annie. Wonderful to see you this morning. Good to see you too. So Nigeria is the first African country to access the international capital market this year. It's raised 1.25 billion via Eurobond. Uh, does this account for the FX reserve increase that we are seeing? I mean, it's hard to say. It just bounces around. It's a very small increase. I wouldn't read too much into it. I mean, it's, it's great that we were able to tap the Eurobond market. Uh, I think the uh, interest rate was lower than was expected. It shows people have confidence in the Nigerian economy. But I, I wouldn't read too much into week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month fluctuations in the FX. There's a lot of moving parts to the FX situation in Nigeria. So you think uh, that increase that we saw in the FX reserve is ignorable? Well, I think sometimes in Nigeria, whether it's inflation or the FX reserve or the GDP numbers, we tend to pay attention to kind of small you know, uh, te temporary blips. I mean, what we should be concerned about is, is the direction of travel for, say, FX reserves positive. As you say, it's the first increase we've seen in a while. So we haven't seen the FX reserves have been pretty stable. We certainly can't say they're increasing over any kind of trend line. And I mean, I think people are all aware now one of the biggest issues going on. I mean, you can ask yourself the question, oil is at $130 a barrel. Why is Nigeria not doing better? And the reality is we're having a real problem with uh, with production, uh, not just with production, but particularly now, I think it's now widely reported that there's a huge amount of theft of onshore oil. So onshore oil is about, I think, 40 percent of the oil that Nigeria produces. And some reports say we're losing 90 percent of that before it gets to market. So if, if we're not benefiting from the oil price, that's the primary reason why, because I mean, you would think if we were truly an oil economy, if oil was $130, we're benefiting, but we don't really see that. And we haven't seen it certainly in the FX uh, exchange, the FX um, reserves. I mean, the number you've cited, it's increased $100 million. That's very little in the context of the Nigerian economy. Yeah, you know, when you, when you mention oil, a lot of uh, pictures just run through one's mind. And one of it is uh, the issue of oil theft and vandalism, which even the government has been complaining about. I guess that's one mm. major reason we haven't been able to uh, make the most of, of, of the oil rally mm. at this time. Yeah, I mean, you go back to 2016, I mean, we were all lamenting the recession brought on by the drop in oil price. So, the, but the converse of that is, you know, we, we should be able to benefit when oil price is high. So, as mm -hmm. I said, I think it's extraordinary and all Nigerians should be asking themselves the question, how is it possible that we have $130 oil 
um, and and we're having such difficulties with exchange rate with the parallel market for the for the naira. Um, of course, part of the reason is because as the price of oil goes up, we we have the subsidy oil subsidy goes up, which is obviously in the news all the time right now, and different views on where to go with that. But we're talking about about three trillion naira subsidy in the current estimates at the current oil price, and then simultaneously, we're not getting the volumes that gets the the dollars into the country. So. It's a bit of a sad situation. We suffered when oil went down and we thought we would benefit when oil gets up, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Is there anything from your perspective that can be done about that? You talked about the onshore oil being a major and yet we seem to be losing a lot from that. Well, I mean, obviously, I think, you know, the security apparatus, I, I'm not an expert in security, but we're all aware of the, the impact it's having on the country and the human toll. I mean, the terrible events in Kaduna over the last uh, the last few weeks is just is just one example. So obviously, there should be efforts there. But I think the other thing, and of course, your previous segment talked about it, is I think there is a unique opportunity uh, to to do gas. And of course, the the previous speaker was saying, you know, we should do gas domestically first. I guess I would say there's so much gas in the country, we can do gas domestically and we can also export more. I mean, and if you go back a few weeks ago before the war, Europe had essentially said it would never invest any more money into hydrocarbons, uh, which really meant it would be very difficult for us to get the investment that was laid out of the national gas plan to exploit the gas. Now Europe, because of the energy security situation, the terrible events in the Ukraine, the relationship with Russia, has recognized that it, it needs alternate sources of gas. And I would assert that probably the number one alternate source is actually um, Nigeria. So I think we should be spending a lot of time as a, as a nation, the federal government, talking to the Europeans, particularly the Germans and the, the relevant energy companies. How do we get gas production up in here and help Europe's uh, energy security situation? I mean, I said, I said a number of months ago, even with the gas strategy, it may be a little too late because people were moving away from investing in hydrocarbons. But now the world has changed. I think we have a chance to benefit from our gas. Uh, NL NLNG has been very successful, uh, but there's many more trains, as they call it, to come to, to expand the gas. And I think we should be urgently looking for that. I mean, we, the central bank and the government as a whole has been very clear we need to increase our effects. Uh, uh, receipts and natural gas is probably the single biggest opportunity over the next sort of two to five years. Yeah, but even if we get investment into developing gas at this time, I mean, there's going to be a time lag between when you invest and when, you know... No, no, I, 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 absolutely. But I mean, as the Chinese say, the best time to track, plant a tree was 50 mm -hmm. years ago, but the second best time is today. I mean, what, exactly. what's our choice? I mean, we were slow with the... Uh, PIA and you know now we have it passed and now we have a change in the geopolitical situation where people urgently want to get new gas very quickly. So projects that might have taken five, seven years in the best of times will now be collapsed to three to five years on that. And we need to take advantage of it. And I, I get your point. We should have done this a decade ago, but we can't change the past. All right. Uh, well, let's go back to that Eurobond conversation we're having. And uh, one of the observations from that uh, uh, Eurobond was investors' interest. You, you mentioned it in Nigeria, and it tightened the price at 8.37 percent per annum. Uh, this investors' interest, and then the tightening of the price. What does it say about Nigeria's economy? Does it say things are not that bad anyway? Well, I mean, I, I personally have been you know, very out publicly saying I, I'm very optimistic about the, the economic future. You can see a lot of things turning in the country. But I think that people outside the country who are knowledgeable do recognize one thing that's critical, which is Nigeria is a very rich country. We have enormous assets. And I don't think and the level of indebtedness we have is actually very small, particularly in, in U.S. dollars. So, I mean, there's not really very little chance of a, a default unless there was some kind of major political event. But as long as we continue to have have a uh, not perfect, but no one's perfect sort of democracy and peaceful transitions of power. Um, you know, I think we're a very good, a very good bet that way. And so we have plenty of assets to cover the kind of borrowing that we have. So it's not a big surprise to me that interest rates would, would come in. And of course, this isn't a world environment where interest rates are rising. But, but I mean, people I think consider Nigeria kind of, as I said, a relatively good bet because of our political relative political stability despite all the challenges but also we just have so many assets gas oil minerals and all sorts of you know i don't think likely will will default those things will be developed instead of defaulting and uh, that brings uh, that also brings the issue of the debt stock of the country to attention i know last year we talked a lot about this 
And now uh, we see that uh, the debt management uh, office has released the, the, uh, for the th fourth quarter of 2021, where we see a 4.1% increase to 39.57%. Trillion. And of course, there's been the argument, it, should it be debt versus GDP or should it be debt versus revenue? From your perspective, what should it be measured against? Well, I think the debt, for, I mean, debt versus GDP is the classic. I mean, we all understand we don't collect much tax revenue. So when you compare the debt or the interest payments to the tax revenue, it seems calamitous. I mean, our view has been very simple. I mean, people uh have said there's a debt problem. We, we don't agree. And then other people have said we have a revenue problem. And, you know, obviously the government should be trying to raise revenue in appropriate ways. But our consistent view is we, we have a growth problem. If the economy grew 6, 8, 10% a year, which is perfectly capable of growing, we wouldn't even be discussing the debt. I mean, the official NBS numbers uh, for the fourth quarter were, were the economy in 2021 is about 200 trillion Naira. Um, now, we also believe that's an underestimate. There's going to be a rebasing. So let's say the economy is 250 trillion Naira. I think personally, maybe a little bit more. But at 250 trillion naira, we have a debt of 40 trillion naira. It's still very small in the context of, of nations around the world. So as I said, we have a growth problem. Once we grow six, eight, ten percent a year, as we should, no one is going to discuss the debt. And then when you say we have a growth problem, how do we get out of that problem? Well, I mean, I think we, you know, we've been consistent in the last few years. Some of the key things that are critical here, again, go back to being a very rich country. So we put out the paper a few years ago on dead assets. So we have too many assets that are not yeah. productive in the country. Uh, I think there's been a lot of movement on that. People talk about dead assets. Obviously, it's been focused on the refineries and energy boots of steel, which are the big national ones. But there's also been a lot, big focus on government real estate assets, things like the National Theater, which are not producing a return, or are now projects to help them produce a return. So I think that's that's one aspect. The, the distortions are things that you know, many people talk about and need to be addressed. So the foil subsidy, the electricity issue, and of course the FX issue, uh, so structural things that need to be addressed. I mean, we have been in the camp for five or six years and saying, look, we need a single unified exchange rate. It's just too difficult to run a business and to take, uh, you know, many businesses, for example, in Nigeria, maybe they produce 85% uh, of the value added in Nigeria. So they'd still need to import a little bit of what they raw materials that are not available here. The problem is when you have such a complex FX regime, an opaque FX regime, um, that becomes difficult. So you're, you're, you're hurting the production where 85% of the value added is in, in Nigeria. So we do think those issues need to be, need to be taken on. Um, we've also said for a number of years that uh, you know, we need a simplification of the way that the, uh, certainly the federal government works, too many MDAs. We know they were created for other purposes, but at this point in time, we had the orange shade report. We haven't quite executed on that. So there's lots of things that, that we know we need to do, but I think we're close to doing some of them. But the most encouraging thing I've seen in the last two or three years is you're really seeing states take their economic testing in their own hands. I think they learned after 2016, they couldn't rely on the, uh, the federal allocation to finance what the state wanted to do. There's a number of governors, they're really trying to take their, their state uh, forward very significantly. I mean, obviously, for us, Governor Obaseki has always been one of the leaders of this, uh, Governor Fayose in, in equity, uh, Governor El Rufai, His Excellency in Kaduna, though he's faced real challenges. So the fact that we're seeing so much happen at the state level, I think, is diffusing throughout the nation. So you get more and more states that are I think electing people that are going to take the state forward, really encouraging to see Governor Saluto, His Excellency, and Anumbra and his plans to go forward, and just his, his confidence, his technical confidence in the economic area on that. So, I mean, we're optimistic, um, and it feels closer to getting to that 6 to 10% growth rate than in my 13 years here. We just need to see fo focus on some of the fundamentals and build on the successes we, we have. And I think a lot of people outside of Nigeria uh, just read the headlines on there, aren't going deep in what's actually happening. I mean, again, to reiterate, we actually think the economy is quite a bit bigger than the NBS reports. It's not a criticism of the NBS, but over 50% of the economy is in the informal sector. It's hard to capture that with official statistics. So we have a lot more economic activity that's going on. But, you know, one other thing I'll, I'll say that's just a major trend for the country is we have more and more young Nigerians inserting themselves into global value chains. Uh, so now, this could happen in a corporate sense. So, companies like Outsource Global, which has a thousand seats in northern Nigeria, 
educated Nigerians serving U.S. and U.K. companies, being paid in dollars, bringing FX into the country, supporting their families with, with high wages. It's also happening at the individual level. We're having people in Nigeria hired as coders, hired as bank compliance officers, getting paid in euros, getting paid in dollars. And I think that that is something that the government really needs to embrace. And in one in particular, the more bandwidth we have, young Nigerians will take advantage of that to mm. insert themselves in global value chains. And I think that's yeah. a really critical economic um, policy the government needs to think about. Yeah, a whole lot uh, you've dished out there. Uh, Nevin, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. And of course, as you mentioned, the informal sector should be incorporated into the MBS uh, data gathering and uh, infrastructure, as you mentioned, uh, one of them being uh, the internet. Thank you so much, Andrew Nevin, always there when we call you Chief Economist at PwC Nigeria. Enjoy the rest of your day. Very welcome, Amy. Thank you so much. So we'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll discuss rural urban migration. Has it gotten better? Is it worse? Find out here on Business Morning on Channels Television. You're welcome back. As of 2020, Nigeria's rural population was at about 99 million. That's a 0.89% increase from 2019. World Bank collection of development indicators places about 48%. That's a population that should not be ignored if Nigeria wants to develop. Well, that's why we're focusing on that group this morning with Mr. Shrive Idris. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Timeline Consult Limited. Good morning, Mr. Idris. Thank you for joining us in the studio. Good morning, and thank you for having me. So this uh, issue of rural urban migration, it's, it's, it's a long-standing conversation. Um, is it a challenge in Nigeria? Uh, let, let me start by saying, uh, yes, it is a challenge but not peculiar to Nigeria. Okay. Uh, rural urban migration and rural development is an issue the world over, whether in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia, uh, talk less of, of Africa. Even in the United States of America, there are policies targeted towards rural development. So it's not peculiar to Nigeria and indeed is a challenge in Nigeria and a big challenge for us. Okay, so... Um is a challenge because when the population moves to the urban, it places more demand and pressure on the infrastructure. So I guess the solution would be to develop the rural area so that we don't have, or, 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 or how do you say that? Well, uh, let's first and foremost situate what do human beings like most? And then when we understand what human beings like most, then you can then see the reason why people uh, move from one part of uh, you know, the globe to another. Mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally, mankind loves to have some basic necessities of life water, electricity, good road, you know, job to do, hospitals, and what have you. Now, because resources are scarce, government is not able to provide these essential services across the length and breadth of uh, you know the a country for example nigeria and when you provide this uh, infrastructure in a few places chances are you know, this infrastructure okay. then becomes more like <laughs> bee, uh, flower to a bee. You know, the, whole, the bee will just uh, go wherever the flower is. Mm -hmm. So mankind will naturally drift towards where, you know, such facilities are provided. You take our Lagos, for example. An average of 15 to 20 million people live in Lagos. Some of us came all the way from uh, <laughs> the, the far north to here for greener pasture. So these are evidences of the rural urban migration, if you like. So if I ask you, making it personal now, what can make you go back to your state of origin? Well, uh, for me, I may not necessarily be the best example, uh, and I'm sorry to disappoint you that I'm not going to leave Lagos until the sea dries. So, <laughs> yes. uh, as a professional, uh, one leaves to come into the city, not just for greener pasture, but to get employment. 
as at the time some of us left our nooks and crannies, the headquarters of most financial institutions, and still till date are in, uh, uh, in, Niger, in Lagos. So we come for professional knowledge and, uh, you know, work so that you can get some livelihood. But the kind of rural urban migration that has been a big challenge to Nigeria is the lower unskilled laborers or laborers that trunch into uh, cities like Kaduna, uh, Portacode, Lagos, and the rest. Uh, if you look at what has been happening, most of these come in to the cities and they stretch the facilities of the cities and they do not have the skills to be employed so that they could add value to the economy. So in essence, they become quote unquote liabilities to the society. And the best way to possibly address this challenge is for government to go back to the basics by providing the necessary infrastructure that will enable these populace to remain in their you know, community and then uh, be productive. Uh, let us take, uh, I, I would like to take us back to the memory lane. During President uh, Babangida's time, we had uh, DIFRI, Directorate of Road, Food and Rural Infrastructure. It was a targeted rural development initiative. We had the People's Bank, which was also poverty alleviation directed uh, intervention. We had the late Professor Olukwe and some Kuti, you know, idea of primary health care in each uh, ward. Those were what we call targeted rural development. Well, how effective were they? I think that and there will also be an offshoot of that. Well, well, you see, it is uh, the juries are out. You know, some feel they were not effective. Some feel they are. But you see, to have a general uh, answer how effective they are, I think it wouldn't be fair. I will say the Professor Olukwe Ransom Kuti's idea of primary health care, you know, centers in the localities were largely successful. I mean, he's not alive, but we are here discussing him. May his soul uh, be blessed, but it was largely successful. Even the Lado Konyan Difri, you know, intervention, they were largely successful. I will give them like 60 percent uh, success because roads were provided, lateral roads were provided. Uh, what we failed to do uh, to stem the tide of the migration was to provide cottage industries that will help to retain the youth that are in those uh, localities. Remember, in Nigeria, 70 percent of the populace uh, you know, employed by agriculture. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a country that lacks sufficient, uh, you know, road networks, and then storage facilities are not there. So if you don't have cottage industries in these localities, when they produce, what do they do? Exactly. You know? I, was, I was going to ask you that, I mean, the country, on the other hand, seems to be losing a lot with this migration because people who should be there to take care of things like agriculture, preservation, maybe if you had industries there, you know, for preservation, storage, and we talk of the value chain in agricultural development. I mean, because it is close to the source, which is mostly the farm where you have the arable land for the agricultural production, and then if you had industries, cottages, like you mentioned, you know, to take care of the preservation and at least begin the value chain, adding value to raw materials. Perhaps all these talks of uh, FX uh, not available for manufacturer and uh, importation of everything, perhaps it would, it would have reduced. It, it, this seems to be part of what the country is losing with this urban migration. We, we, are, we, are, certainly, we are certainly losing. And I do agree with your thought that if we have cottage industries that are processing, you know, the basic agricultural produce from the localities, number one, you know, the rural urban migration will significantly reduce. Uh, number two, we will also provide employment. So the insecurity we are facing today will also significantly reduce. Uh, we, we are making some reasonable level of progress based on my little understanding of uh, the situation in Nigeria. I can tell you,
uh, in the last 20 years, if you take a census of how many villages that were connected to the national grid, uh, you will realize that there is some level of improvement. Number two, with the telephone that has come into being the global uh, system for mobile, that is a GSM, almost each uh, knock and cranny is now being connected with telephone. And by that, we are able to do some financial services, POS are being provided. So there are and there has been some marked improvement. However, as far as cottage industries are concerned, the two or three development banks that we have that are supposed to be helping in those directions do not appear to be you know, doing as much as they should do. Bank of Industries, for example, Bank of Agriculture, Development Bank of Nigeria, uh, Infrastructure Bank of Nigeria, these should be doing much more than what they are doing as far as targeted rural uh, development initiatives so that we can have improvement in storage facilities, improvement in the processing capacities of, uh, you know, the agricultural uh, value chain like you, you, you stated. Otherwise, you know, we will continue to have this challenge. Well, I, I guess that challenge remains because of issues like infrastructure, you mentioned road, you mentioned power. Uh, but we, we have the Rural Electr Electrification Agency. Uh, and uh, they've been talking a lot recently, uh, sending, sharing mini-grids mini and alternative power to the rural areas. How effective? Uh, honestly, honestly, the National Rural Electrification Agency appears to be all talk, 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 no much action. I have not seen much of their impact in the localities that I frequent. And Mark, you am a frequent traveler in Nigeria, both the east and the west, the north, the south, I do travel a lot, mostly and largely by road, and you don't see so much of their impact. Yet, so much money is being, uh, you know, expended on. Maybe, maybe they should retreat and look at technology and say, how do I impact in the rural areas. Why don't we look at wind uh, powered, you know, initiatives? Can they doing more of solar? You know, the solar, you know, requires so much land, so much panel, and so much capital. So there are better ways that they can impact so much in these rural areas. And I bet you, without electricity, we are certainly doomed. Uh, in, if you look at the whole country like Nigeria, we are uh, generating 5,000 megawatts of electricity. Sometimes. 200 million. <laughs> Sometimes. 220 5, million. 220 million. South Africa, with just about 40, 50 million population, is uh, generating close to about 55,000 megawatts. Uh, the quantum of what we lose, what we call post harvest losses in agriculture, is unimaginable. Just imagine tomatoes. Those of us that live in Lagos, before they produce tomato in Kano or other parts of the country to bring it here, 40% of it is lost in the process of transportation. And that you and I have to pay because by the time it comes here, the person who lost that 40% wouldn't want to lose the money. So he will first recover the loss and then make some gains. Mm -hmm. So we need to do a lot in terms of Yeah, you know, of what, when you said that, I remember a picture. I was doing a road from, I think, from Kaduna to Kano. And right Right on the road, you could see tomatoes, tomatoes and pepper, yes, potatoes. just down you know, there, yeah. and, and then they're just going bad. Yeah. Because, I mean, these are smallholder farmers. They do not have anywhere to preserve it. There's no company that can do an offtake from them, you know, to start the processing. So at the end of the day, some part of the country is hungry, and in some parts of the country... Is yeah. Western money, Western the food. Exactly, exactly. And if you, you, if you even widen the discussion to even bananas, pineapple that the Cross River people produce, Ginger, when I went you to know, Southern Kaduna, uh, yes, ginger is one interesting product or crop that Nigeria seems not to be exploring in Southern Kaduna. They have a lot of it. You know, if you just go behind somebody's house and then you see plantation of. Of I, I tell you, the Chinese are 
taking advantage of that. Yes. It's unfortunate to discuss, you know, these that we are in Nigeria and the Chinese are coming to take advantage. I'm happy that uh, recently the government came up with a policy that foreigners should not be allowed to trade. But at a point, I know a Chinese that is trading in excess of 500 million naira worth of ginger per season. I mean, this is what we, we see every now and then. And uh, unfortunately, again, the government sometimes appears to be helpless, or rather our policy makers appear to be bereft, well, we have the policies. bereft, of, bereft of ideas. We do have the policies. Does it seem that we are bereft of policies? It seems implementation is actually the problem. I, I agree with you. It can be implementation. It can be also lack of the policies. To what extent are these policies? appropriate, adequate, and timely issued. Sometimes the policies come in a little too late, sometimes they are inappropriate, and sometimes the implementation becomes an issue. Remember, every now and then we see the Nigerian factor, the Nigerian factor. Otherwise, how do you explain that in the last 25 years, we cannot fathom how to address the issue of, say, tomato uh, puree, we import tomato. How do you explain the fact that we have land that we, pro we produce cotton, yet we import cotton wood? How do you explain the fact that we produce firewood and we are importing toothpick? I mean, and, and I we, hope we're we, not still importing <laughs> toothpick, please don't so, make me cry. So the, the, the challenges are, is, is not just the policy, whether they are there or not. I do agree implementation is an issue, but we also don't have monitoring and evaluation and mechanism. Mm. All right. <laughs> Not a very pleasant picture there, but it's our reality for now. Unfortunately. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Shoaib Idris, the Chief Executive Officer of Timeline Consult Limited. Thank you for sharing your thoughts thank with you us. Thank you for having morning. me. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your day. Thank you. Well, that's it uh, for that conversation. Not a very pleasant picture, but we'll keep talking and uh, hopefully things will change with time. For now, let's head to the market. We have Anete uh, standing by. Hello, Anete. Good to see you. Yeah, hello, Ine. Um, I, I hope it's not too late for me to say uh, Happy New Month, if you believe in that kind of greeting. <laughs> happy New Month to you. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now I have, uh, I have about four markets to review uh, the activities last week, the last week of um, March, and then, of course, this is the first full week of uh, April. So I will be taking you on how the markets close, starting first with the fix, with the FX market. It was kind of mixed here when you take a look at um, the performance here. Total value, the total value of transactions there was up by 41.77%. Then if you take a look at the FX spot market, it was down by 3.74%. But the other markets were slightly up. Uh, Forest market was up by 11.36%. Futures market was much uh, much higher at more than 1,107% uh, 1, 1, of, of overall uh, at that market. So it just tells you that there, there was a, a kind of, uh, in contrast to the previous week, there was an increase in the volume of Forex transaction at that market on the FMDQ. Let's flip over to the um, NAFEX market. It was down mildly by 0.01%. Uh, in contrast to what we had the Naira doing at 470, 415 Naira 77 Koba, it closed last week as at April 1st at 415 Naira 81 Koba. So this is what, uh, this is the margin at which it slipped at the close of the week last week. Over to the fixed income market. It was, uh, uh, well, it, it closed with mixed sentiment, but at the same time with a bullish tilt. And this is because um, markets, um, the market reacted to uh, higher stock rates, um, uh, which dampened the buying interest witness in the early part of the week. Consequently, average yield there declined slightly by one basis point to 10.7%. But taking a look at the board, what we have here, the total number of deals is a square in terms of deals. And then, of course, also square for the 23rd of February, uh, 2028 paper as well as the 22nd of January 2026 paper. In all, the total number of deals there carried out was six at a value of 3.80%. Over to the Treasury bills market, number of deals 
it was uh, not too impressive, but to give us more uh, highlights on how the market uh, closed last week, especially when you talk about the OMO operations there and then what to look out for in the month of April. Let's talk to Tomechuku Ipe, who is a fixed, uh, is a fixed income dealer at Access Bank. Thank you for joining us, Tobe. Thank you for having me here. Now, in your just one word, how would you describe the market in the month of March, especially when we had a current kind of mixed sentiment, buy side and sell side on some papers? So give us more insight on that. Uh, okay, Anita, you used the word I would like to use. Mixed, that's how the, we treated during a um, match uh, for the fixed income markets, treated and bonds. A new point on a policy note, and then the month following several auctions of the NCB or more. And bond auctions that have been affected during the month, um, we saw the market plan very slow because of the month, and it will uh, intend to sell some of the papers. Okay, uh, last week we saw the CBN sold about, uh, at the OMO auction, uh, CBN sold about 50 billion worth of uh, bills to market participants and maintained stop rates across the three tenors with uh, the previous uh, uh, auctions. And then eventually they offered about 143.29 billion. So now, how, how is the market still reacting to this uh, as we speak? So, you know, the CBN. Um, we should do more trust to move the rate from system where they just tank speed and speed the max speed for some sector return. So last week I said they don't have to see the credit margin for the thing offering in recent weeks or on the March we saw them point up three home auctions and offer the total of sixty billion as well as sixty billion across each option, which was out from the preceding month of February, where they offered an average of about 70 billion across the auction like February. However, instead, they maintained the um, stop rates at 7.5 and 10.1% across all tenants. So the market is um, really exciting as now. They are um, within a um, market sentiment and where the liquidity will come from because the home auction takes a liquidity from the system and with this intelligence we are seeing currently, we should see some undertones in the market. Okay, uh, uh, Toby, we thank you for that um, analysis of the market. And then, of course, uh, like usual, we definitely will keep our eyes on that market. Well, Ine, so that's it for the fixed income markets. Yeah, well, uh, like, as you noticed, uh, I think a lot of almost they matured last week. That's what you're talking about, the 50 billion that are going to the market. Liquidity is an issue and a lot of analysts are saying it's going to be dry this week, but we'll certainly watch and see mm. as the new quarter begins. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll head to the equities market and of course, there are other conversations for you to join us. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we still have Anita standing by now. He's heading to the equities. Hello, Anita. So um, I know you're doing a recap for the quarter, for the month. How did the equities do? Well, uh, Anita, th thank you for reminding me. We're in a new quarter. And of course, when you take a look last week, see the board here, red is the picture. And that red picture, it was also a cut across in terms of sectoral performance. The month of March wasn't too good for the equities market. 0.23% is what it printed at the close of Friday's trading uh, on the NGX. And that, of course, translates to about 58 billion in value terms. It, and then in percentage terms for the, for the market's value, it was down by 0.26%, which is higher than what we see in terms of the all share index performance. And that's no thanks to uh, losses in the, in the, uh, from, from what we call the full gas, uh, five, five tier one lenders, the likes of Zenith Bank, GTCO, and Access Bank. They weighed the market down by that margin. Now, in terms of sectoral performance, take a look at it. The banking sector, like I mentioned, those three uh, 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 banking uh, stocks, bellwethers, they had uh, uh, the, the largest effect on the banking spec mm -hmm. sector space. It was down by 7.13%. So month to date, we're at about 1%, about but year to date, we're still in positive terrain, 10%. And then we will be talking about that when we speak to our guest who is on the line now, David Adorin. Thank you for joining us, David. Pleasure being with you. Now, as you can see, the month of March, actually, I think last week, though, we had kind of a flurry of activities. About 30 companies mentioned, they, they, they announced, they made some dividend announcements. 
And then at, at the same time, we also have Axis Bank, which when you take a look at the board here, it was in the red, but also Axis Bank has transited to a holding company. So now, how is that uh, having an impact on the market as we speak? Okay, yeah, just like you mentioned, uh, last week uh, there were a uh, series of uh, activities uh, in the market, and um, that of the uh, Access Bank was a high point. The transition from uh, a, a, a PLC normal company to the whole cost structure was uh, a wonderful development, and uh, uh, simultaneously, as uh, the whole core was uh, being listed um, on the platform of NGX, uh, the, the listed uh, Access Bank PLC was uh, also listed on the NASD uh, OTC platform. You know, so there are intricacies uh, surrounding that. Maybe we'll discuss that uh, in future time. Will not uh, permit. Mm. You know, but a lot of uh, full year results uh, were also released uh, last week quite a lot of them, and um, most of them were actually very, very impressive. But we had uh, some shocking uh, uh, results, like the one from International Breweries um, PLC, which was a loss of about uh, 16 billion. But despite uh, the decline in profit uh, by USCN, it was still able to pay dividend of about 5 Cobo. Mansa um, did not make any profit, okay. yet it was still able to pay dividend of 25 Cobo. Yeah, uh, David. Yeah, uh, David. Uh, sorry, I may have to me. cut you. Um, I may have to cut you now because of time, uh, time constraints. Okay. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, um, what we call brief analysis of the markets, and definitely we keep eyes out on that. So, okay, any, I need you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. So that was David Adorin, uh, stockbroker at uh, High Cap Securities Limited, speaking to us about the market. So, any that's yeah. all for the markets. Yeah, but thank before you I so go, much. this is how the activity turned out for the week it was not just all the reds all right thank you so much uh, anita thanks for that uh, uh, analysis from the market uh, well we do hope to have a, a, a more green market <laughs> this month even as we begin the quarter we do hope it to be a, more, a greener market than it was uh, a lot of profit taking took place uh, in the equities market last month uh, that's in march well, we hope that the profit taking is over and then we'll see a lot of bargain hunting at this time. Uh, we now switch over to the crypto market now and Ladi is standing by. Hello, Ladi. Hello, Eni. Well, well, it's good to have you on that side today <laughs> and have me on this side. Yeah, we, we switched it yeah. uh, today. But, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the market is, uh, the crypto market today is looking, you know, quite, uh, is quiet now. Everyone watching uh, Bitcoin's, you know, next move. We've seen, you know, even but Bitcoin, but Bitcoin uh, has gained market. compared to Friday. Yeah, it has gained, but you know, you know how traders expect more from Bitcoin. But at this time, it's being quite uh, uh, quiet as moment. Everybody is watching Bitcoin's uh, next move and uh, looking at the. Uh, sentiment in the market right now uh, that's talking about the fear greed index we're seeing 52 points it's at neutral hasn't it, it did get to greed you know at some point uh, last week but we're back at neutral uh, showing that you know traders are still looking for direction in this market a uh, market cap still sitting above two trillion dollars it's 2.16 uh, trillion dollars at 24 hour volume traded in the total crypto space as bitcoin uh, plus the altcoins 94.43 billion dollars that's down about 13 percent this morning Bitcoin dominance uh, sitting at uh, about 40%. Uh, percent. Uh, price of Bitcoin, uh, $46,233 this morning. We see it is uh, holding that key point at 45000 Traders are watching that level. Anything below that level could you know, continue a, a new uh, decline you know, for the price of Bitcoin. But traders are watching that level uh, uh, very much this morning. Volume trade at $27.09 billion. And we see Ethereum, they're still holding up uh, strong this morning, despite, you know, Bitcoin having a marginal pullback. We're seeing uh, Ethereum up about 0.12%. Volume trade at $15.25 uh, billion. And looking at the top alt by market cap, it's uh, mostly red on that counter. But we see Cardano still holding up, uh, well, it's up about 3.35% at a dollar 21 cents we're seeing bnb they're having a pullback 1.14 percent and uh, solana solana has had an incredible run it was below the hundred dollar mark just a few weeks ago but now uh, we saw that uh rally for bitcoin we've seen solana also uh inch up there 
It's at $136 at 29 cents per coin. And we see XRP there still stable around the 80 uh, cent mark. Let's bring in uh, Illumide Additional now, financial market analyst. Hello, Illumide. Happy Monday. Yeah, happy Monday to you. Uh, it's been a triple Grammy uh, week. <laughs> yeah, so, Illumide, I, I saw the uh, headline today about uh, a, a Bitcoin, you know, just 2 million Bitcoins left to be mined. We've mined 19 million bitcoins uh, already at this point uh what impact will this have on the market just two million bitcoins yeah, interesting. Left. yeah interesting understanding bitcoins and inflationary properties you know uh, the fact that it has a fixed supply you know it's been said that um, just 21 million will be mined and i think um, before that will take uh, the last bitcoin before and i think nobody will be on it because it will take um, the year 2140. Uh, so uh, the uh, the anti properties make bitcoin very suitable for what uh, preservation and edge against inflation but uh, the direct implication now has shown that uh, the difficulty level of mining bitcoin has rose to roughly uh, 28.5 trillion and what that means for people that don't really understand um, the, uh, the uh, difficulty levels, the computing power needed uh, by miners to uh, produce Bitcoin is get, getting much more uh, tougher. So, uh, interestingly, uh, we've seen that the hash rate is quite stable. Uh, we've seen that uh, the fact that adoption is relatively um, decent, despite the fact that we are seeing an orkish uh, U.S. Fed era. So uh, I think one of the things we need to look at, is, like you rightly said, the market uh, price action is that Bitcoin has fairly been stable, despite the fact that it has um, dropped from um, a key level, you know, to the $45,000 uh, level. Uh, but having said that, we've seen that the adoption in the NFT space and the, the, eco, the ecosystem around Ethereum is making Ethereum quite exciting, and that's why you rightly said that we, we saw Ethereum still ranging around $3,500. But I think it's still um, safe to say caution is needed because the market is showing that volatility is coming to play with a uh, report that Russian uh, participated in some war crimes across the week. So that will definitely create some market volatility for investors. Yeah, all eyes on uh, more sanctions at this point. But it'd be interesting exactly. to see, you know, what happens when the final Bitcoin is actually mined. I wonder if we'll still need miners at that point. Thank you so much, Olumide. Thank you. All right, so in the, uh, looking at the top five gainers there, we're still seeing double-digit gains. We see uh, Rose there's up 13%. Uh, Mina and uh, Pancake Swap there had a, a, a nice run. It was trading about $0.05 cents a couple of weeks ago. Now $10.16 per coin. It's up 10% this morning. So in the uh, altcoins are doing really well in, in this market at this point. Yeah, well, uh, I believe you, Ladi, whatever you say. But I tell you, I can't get that conversation you just had with Olumide off my mind. It's just two million, just Bitcoin, two million Bitcoin left, left. to be mined. <laughs> That should send that price up. I mean, yeah, exactly. when when uh, when supply is limited, you yeah, get... that, that's the interesting, you know, part about uh, Bitcoin: limited supply on limited demand. Quite <laughs> incredible. Very incredible.